Good morning. Glad to see everybody here today. I know there's a lot of folks on vacation, but this is good, pretty good crowd here tonight today, and I appreciate uh, everybody being here today. So we're going to celebrate the fourth today. We're going to celebrate our independence. You know, 243 years that, that our nation has, has been here, uh, signed the, the Declaration of Independence, independence on the, the 4th of July, 1776. 243 years that we've been here. The land of the free, home of the brave, one nation under God. We're going to celebrate that some today. So uh, celebrate with us as our choir sings Spirit of America. Independence Day to you all, and what a great day it is to be able to come. And uh, I was thinking this morning, you know, my brother and sister, they, my brother-in-law and sister, they live in a country. Many of you know that they can't even openly call it church. They have to say that they're fellowshipping with uh, their, with, you know, in their uh, fellowship is what they call. It. They're, they're meeting with their fellowship today, or their, their friend group, or their home group. And you know, we live in a place we are so blessed because men and women have bled and died so that we can meet in this place openly, to 
to call it a church, to call it God's people, and not be ashamed of that. And so we want to, first of all, this morning say thank you. Thank you to those who have served, who are serving. And if, uh, really, I'd just like to take a minute to recognize, if we can, anybody that is uh, currently active or has served in the military. If you wouldn't mind just standing so that we can recognize you and appreciate you this morning. Thank you. And I'm excited about the rest of our time of worship. We decided to kind of do something a little bit different. We had planned on having a separate patriotic service tonight, but just uh, through some communication back and forth, uh, we moved it up to this morning, and I'm really encouraged just to see the turnout of the choir. It's awesome this morning. You guys, that sounded great. It's going to be incredible. And uh, so we're, we're, we combined tonight with this morning, and we're going to do all of it here. So we won't have any service this evening here on campus, so spend that time with friends and family. I know that many have some in from out of town and just maximize that time of blessing that you guys have there together. Uh, do you have some announcements here that are worth looking into? We got a Scattering Seeds new cookbook is going to be coming out. It's a little one, right, Ms. Carrie? It's not the big, it's a little one. So if you have a recipe, maybe a quick hit, just throw that over to Ms. Carrie and, and uh, it is absolutely worth uh, putting into it. Ms. Carrie, just by the way, I might submit one. Is that okay? Is it okay if I steal it from the internet and just give credit? Okay, I was just making sure. I, we did on Thursday, or on Friday, we made a chocolate chest pie at my house. I love chocolate chest pie. That's my favorite. Saturday morning, I walk into the kitchen and Joy, my sweet, wild, hurricane, thir uh, almost three-year-old, has a spatula eating it out of the pie pan. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, you can't make that stuff up. So we did something right. So I'll, I'll try to submit that if I can really do so. So uh, please do get that. You can email Ms. Carrie's email address is right there in the announcements. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet for the senior adult trip to the McWayne Science Center and the Shrine of the Most Blessed out here on the table. If you can uh, sign up for that, uh, we'd be glad to have that happen as well. Guys, we have a car alarm going off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you have your, just beep it. See if it knocks it off. It's still going. All right. Well, if you're parked right up here, you may have your car alarm maybe going off, just so you know. Uh, our children's ministry has taken donations for school supplies and items. Uh, we've made the teacher's supply baskets. That's not kind of where we are now. We now need supplies for students. So we'll, we're taking cash donations for that or also the actual direct supplies. We'll get a list to you of that. Miss Wendy is not well this morning. I want to be lifting her up, praying for her. Deadline for that is uh, next Sunday. So you can sign up for the adult trip, by the way. Um, like I said, no shout, uh, no um, service here tonight. There's a couple other announcements in there. Uh, our children and chaperones do leave this Friday on July the 12th to go to kids camp. They're going to be going to Shaco Springs. So we want to be praying for them as we commission them out to go. Uh, that kids camp is an awesome time to hear from the word of the Lord to, uh, I mean, to come to salvation. I know that that's a place where I heard a ton growing up, going to cross points, some others that we did about the love of Jesus and seeing other people that could demonstrate that for us as well. Well, we're going to go into the rest of our time of worship in song here and also in studying God's word. So we encourage you to join in that with us together. Sing the songs you know and just in time, enjoy our time of fellowship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to worship together today. May we, as we worship, God, remember those who have come before us to make it possible. Thank you for giving us a country that we can, uh, God, worship in and to love. Uh, Lord, I, I know that you love broken things. You love broken people. And so even though, God, our country is broken, and uh, even though it needs repair and needs you, Father, we still love it. We're not abandoning the work that you've started here. We want to see you uh, return, God, as a prominent presence of the church and of loving people in the standard for righteousness. In your name we pray. Again, in the hymnals, let's all stand together as we sing the offertory. Fifteen, we'll sing the first and last.
us during this week. And Lord, I hope the praise continue, Lord. So be with us this time of service. We uh, repay just a small portion of what you bless us with. And be with us in service as we uh, listen to your message. Then turn over to uh, 721. We have a responsive reading today. I'm going to start out reading, and if you'll read the bold. God in country. Give everybody a chance to get there. 721. 721. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to many people. 
for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto the governors, as unto the governor sent by him, for the punishment of the evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God, the things that are God. Thank you. You know, the evangelist Billy Sunday said once that uh, Christianity and patriotism are synonymous a term. And that hell and traitors were also a synonymous term. You know, and I believe that God's goals and our country's goals should be one and the same. Should always be one and the same. Romans 13 said that everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Let's sing together. Onward, Christian soldiers.
If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom. And that's why we stand and say that I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, and New York to LA. Well, there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say that I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the you. Yeah, I think there's a difference between the good thing, like being proud to be an American, right, like you're just saying, but there's a difference between that and being a proud American. You see, there's a, a stigmatism across the world that we as Americans are a proud people and are full of pride to the point that those in more humble cultures that are humble culturally, maybe not necessarily in the eyes of the Lord, but at least in their behavior, struggle to understand how we walk well with the Lord or how we walk with the Lord at all. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with being proud to be an American, right? Like, uh, for example, like Mr. Don, I don't have your American flag tie. I wish I did, but I tell you, today I did go with some Captain America socks. Does that count come close? That's what I, I mean, I'm proud to be an American. I love, I mean, I love the red, white, and blue. I love the flag. I love the fact that we live in a place that is free and people can speak up for what they believe in. But folks, I'll just be honest. As Americans, we got a problem with pride, a big problem. It's a problem that doesn't just exist on a, a political level. It's a problem that goes all the way down to the deep core of our hearts. We're so proud sometimes to the point that we refuse to allow others to help us up. We idealize and ideologize this idea of being able to pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps and yet the problem with that is that the gospel is just the opposite of that the gospel tells us the story that Jesus has to have all of you because you can't do it on your own the story of the gospel is we are sick and dead apart from Christ not that we have can get better not that there's recovery but there is new life that has to be given and the disciples as they walk with Jesus could not understand this. You see, they were proud to be with Jesus. They were very proud to be with Jesus. They were proud to be with Jesus because they were just sure he was going to be the next king of Israel. 
And so as people do, when they kind of see down the line where people are going, they start talking about, you know, maybe some things that might happen one day. Like a political officer getting ready to take office begins to form what a cabinet may look like. And so by the time a president steps into office, they've got a plan for their first hundred days, and they've got a plan for a chief of staff, and they've got a plan for the cabinet positions, and if not all of them, at least most of them, so that they can line that plan up so that when they come in office, they're ready to go. And the disciples are thinking this way in terms of Jesus. They're thinking, you know, he's going to take office, he's going to take the throne, and when he steps in, I'm going to be there with him. I'm going to have a job to do, and, and I'm proud to do that. And Jesus, look, there's nothing wrong with being in Christ. In, in fact, instead, what Paul says is that we boast in Christ. The, there is something to be said for being proud to be an American and being proud to be a Christian. I am proud to be a Christ follower. But there's a difference between being proud to be a Christ follower and being a proud Christ follower. So this morning we're talking about this path on the way to the cross and this path through the cross, through resurrection into eternity. And, and the, first, the first stop on this path was just laying out the gospel itself, saying that Mark is the story of the good news of Jesus. But as we've gone and as the disciples and others, the scribes and the Pharisees and even his own family have struggled... They cannot get past this issue of national pride and collective pride, which prohibits them from understanding Jesus' actual purpose. We're going to be in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37 this morning. If you want to flip and find that passage, you can. We'll be there together studying and reading. We'll, we'll be moving on again next week going through. But as we take a step-by-step process through the gospel and through the book of Mark, we want to see how Jesus is trying to reshape this misunderstanding that the disciples and other people have about his identity. The disciples have now misunderstood Jesus, we're going to see, twice in two different stories in just a couple of successive weeks about his purpose. So if you would look at Mark chapter 9, verse 30, if you have your Bible and you want to stand, we're going to stand at the reading in honor of God's word. You can stand with me. It says in Mark chapter 9, verse 30, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. Now remember, Galilee is the area he's been doing ministry in all over the place. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, this is his teaching that he's telling them, they misunderstood it the first time, they're going to misunderstand it again. Here's the the saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum's where he lives. That's Peter's home. It's where they're from. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and t- taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would give us the discernment to understand the difference this morning, God, between being proud Americans, proud Christians, who are proud of being in you, and being proud people. A proud people with pride that needs to be broken. Because, God, the path to the cross clearly comes through humility. So give us eyes to see humility in this passage, eyes to see how to differentiate in our heart self from service and from serving. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So um, there's two different stories going on here, right? But it's really one successive story. It's Jesus is on his way through Galilee on the way to Capernaum, which is where he lives, where Peter lives. We know Peter's home is there. He probably lives with him. And so they go in this, they're on the way, and they're kind of arguing, you can tell they're bickering, they're saying something, and he, and he stops and he tells them his identity once again. It's almost like to say, I kind of know what you guys are talking about, even though you don't know that I know, and I'm telling you, you need to understand, my purpose is not to make you more financially rich, it is not to rule this kingdom, I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to come back. And they kind of all look at each other. And nobody really knows what to say. And because they don't know what to say and they don't want to look like fools because there's pride in their heart, they choose not to ask anything. Remember that. It's important. Then fast forward. 
Now they're in the home, they're at the house, and Jesus looks at them and says, hey, uh, by the way, what were you guys talking about on the way home? And you know, they, they got to just go, God, I thought he forgot. I can't believe you remembered. What, what were you guys talking about? And they're ashamed, right? They're ashamed because they had been arguing about who was going to be greater. Who gets to be his chief of staff? Who gets to be on the cabinet? Who gets to be the vice president? Who gets to be ruling with him? Jesus is not concerned with that. Clearly he's not concerned with that. And they knew it wouldn't make him happy to know that that's what they were arguing about. Because he had just told them what his purpose was. See, in the, in the second story, they misunderstand where true value rests. Which is why they could not understand the first story to begin with. And one would be hard-pressed to blame them for not understanding what Jesus meant, by the way. I mean, they thought as other people in their day thought. They thought as culture thought. They valued as other people in their day valued. They valued like their world around them valued. So how might we compare their thought process to our own thought process? Because I think there's a correlation there. There's a comparison to be made. We must understand the cost of discipleship and to understand why the disciples could not understand it if we're not going to make the same mistakes that they made. So, two things that we see from this passage, I think they're going to give us some applicational points. Because, I mean, here's what this thing's really about. The path itself, the path we're talking about, it is a discipline of humility. To stay on the path, to walk it, not to fall in sin, not to falter, not to fall away, it is going to take a discipline of humility to walk faithfully with Jesus. So, here's the first thing that's going to, apply to this. Pride blinds us from the truth. Pride blinds us from the truth. It it blinds us from the path. It's like clicking off your flashlight at night where you're just wandering in the middle of nothing. Let's look at the passage and, and see if maybe this can help us understand it. Verses 30 and 31, Jesus again teaches the disciples what's going to happen to him and really to them as well. And, and they still don't understand because they're looking for the wrong kind of king, right? They don't understand, it doesn't click with them because they're looking for the wrong kind of king. And they not only do they still not understand, but they're also afraid to ask him what he's saying. I mean, look, you've had probably mentors in your life who have taught you how to do things. Um, I've, I've, you know, picked up things here and there just with your hands, learning how to do some stuff. And here's one thing I figured out. You want to know the fastest way to keep making the same mistake over and over again? Men especially. Listen up, you ready? The fastest way to make the same mistake over and over again, and by the way, clear yourself because an elbow might be coming in from somebody sitting next to you, refuse to ask for help. Anybody? Not even an amen out of that? Come on, y'all now, right? I mean, the fastest way to make the same mistake over and over again and not get any better with something is to refuse to ask for help. You want to stay lost? Refuse to ask for help. You want to keep making the same mistake over and over in your home craft project or your woodworking project or your job or whatever else? Refuse to ask for help. You want to mess up the same break job over and over and over again? Refuse to ask for help. Okay? That's the quickest way to mess something up. And what happens here? Jesus tells them who he is and it says that they're what? Afraid to ask for help. Do you know why we're afraid to ask for help? You know why we're afraid to ask for help? Because we're afraid that people will see our failures. We're afraid that people will see our failures. Can I tell you a secret? Guess what? They're going to see your failures no matter what. They're going to know. You've only got so many excuses in your system for why you can't do X, Y, Z. Something at work, something at school, something in your home. There are only so many excuses that are going to work. Uh, it's swimming time, right? Summertime. Anybody been swimming in the pool? Come on, amen. Yeah, there you go. All right, how about this? Would anybody be brave enough to say, I don't know how to swim? I, didn't know, I don't know if we'd get anybody or not, okay? Here's the thing. People are embarrassed to not know how to swim. My grandmother, whom I love dearly, my nini, she does not know how to swim. She is terrified of being around water. She will not go and get in a pool of any kind, even just if it's just the shallow end, because she doesn't know how to swim. And I've heard her come up with a hundred different excuses before finally one day, when I was a little kid, and I would just pester and pester and pester. I said, come on, please, come swim. She said, sweetie. And it just broke her to say, Nene doesn't know how to swim. Because we have pride built up in our hearts. 
But folks, if we refuse to ask for help, that pride is going to blind us from life-giving truth. Life-giving truth. And for the disciples, this was the ultimate life-giving truth. The life-giving truth that they could, they had the wrong idea about who Jesus is. Look, there's a lot of things you can be wrong on that are safe, okay? It is safe to be wrong about a left turn or a right turn as long as you're not turning into traffic, right? And it's safe to mess up a right turn and a left turn. But there's a couple things you don't want to be wrong on. Uh, right now we have a ceiling fan in our house that has got two lights that it's not the bulbs that are wrong. The wiring has come loose since corrosion, okay? We know it's built up on there. And I know that when you go to pull that fan off and you go to fix that thing, there's one thing you really don't want to be wrong about. You know what that is? Turn off the power. You know what happens if you don't turn off the power and you touch those things? Hello. Merry Christmas. You may not wake up till then if you wake up at all. It will light you up. You check and don't double check. Last time we had a mess with, the, with one of those I put in a dishwasher, I turned off the power to the whole house. I, I don't even mess with it. Don't give me one room or anything else. I don't even want to take a chance. Shut the air conditioner down and everything else. I'll sweat before I want to mess with a live wire. Because we don't want to be wrong, right? There are some things you don't want to be wrong about. Folks, this is one of those things. The gospel is one of those things. You cannot, hear me, you cannot afford to be wrong about your relationship with Jesus. It's not, that's one of, you just can't miss this. It is not worth eternity for you to miss what a relationship with Jesus looks like. And if you're afraid to ask, afraid to admit, because you're afraid of what people will look at you like, if they know that you've been going to church your whole life, and yet you don't have a relationship with Jesus, or what do they think if I have to go to get baptized, and I've never you know, followed Jesus in baptism before, and I've said to be a Christian for 50 years. You know what people are going to do? They're going to cheer. They're going to cheer for you. They're going to cheer for God. For what he's done in your life. You know what's going to happen if you come down and repent of your sin if you've never done so before and maybe people have thought so or assumed so? You know what? Nobody's going to go, oh, can you believe that? That's what, Je that's what Satan tells us, isn't it? Oh, they, he would, they would just be so ashamed. There would not be one person here who is a faithful believer in Christ who would say, I'm ashamed of that person for living a lie. They would be so overwhelmed with unencumbered joy at someone coming to Christ. That we don't even care. And even if somebody did, is that worth it? What it would cost to get, be wrong about the truth of life. Pride will hide truth from your eyes. Second thing we see here is that humility reveals the path of truth. I know I'm really breaking new ground here, right? Pride hides the truth. Humility reveals the truth. But sometimes, folks, a message is just simple. A message is just simple. Here's the simple truth. Humility is going to show you the right way to go. Humility is slow. It doesn't chase. Humility is perceptive. It is not rash. Humility reveals the path of truth. Second part of the story, we said it's in two stages. The first is the disciples being ashamed. The second is Jesus bringing them into his house, bringing them into Peter's house and saying, okay, let's talk about this. Let's, let's work this out. Let's hash this out because I, I know you guys were talking about something on the way home and I need you to understand what's really going on. So Jesus, again, teaches the disciples what must happen to them and, and he sets out this plate. They under misunderstand it and now he's going to dive deeper. Jesus comes home, he confronts the disciples about what they were discussing on the path. Look at verse 33. And when they came to Capernaum, when they were on the way home, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Now, again, he's giving them every single opportunity to admit, hey, guys, what did you miss? And I'll, I'll just say this for me, sometimes God has to knock you and me over the head to say, what are you missing? And I know it feels like I'm repeating it over and over again, but sometimes we just need to hear that. What are you missing? What is God trying to tell you? He's asking you over and over again, hey, what are you talking about? What are you missing out on? What are you not following? Because if you don't listen and you don't eventually change, there is only one destination. If we do not have Christ in our heart and a relationship with him, folks, hell is a real place. It is a real place. 
and the consequences for being blinded by pride are real. Proper perspective of that truth does something to pride, though. Proper perspective embarrasses and exposes pride. Jesus said, what are you talking, Jesus knows the truth. He knows what's going on in their heart. And when he asks them, they become embarrassed. Do you know why? You know why that is? They become embarrassed for the same reason my grandmother was embarrassed that she couldn't swim. Deficiencies. Same reason we get embarrassed, right? Somebody asks you, oh, do you know so-and-so? You don't know who they're talking about? You have no reason to be embarrassed to say, no, I don't know who that is. But we kind of do sometimes. Can I tell you about one of the times when I got most embarrassed? Is that okay? As, as a pastor? Okay. I was in, um, I don't know if I've shared this story before, but I was pastor in Mississippi. You know, it's a different place, different language, different everything else. They speak English, but it ain't real English. Uh, so you, you get there, and, uh, and somebody had had not a car accident, but he had fallen off of something and, and came in, and he was kind of giving this number, you know, kind of walking a little ginger, 84 years old, we call him Dirt because he's old as Dirt, named Tom, but we call him Dirt, Moses. So it said, uh, he said, you know, man, I, I'm just, I'm all stove up. Stove up? What in the world do you mean stove up? But I didn't say anything, and so they keep talking and keep talking, and eventually it comes and kind of just says, bro, Les, you know what stove up means, right? Now, you got two options at that point. You can go, yeah, yeah, I know what stove up means, or you can go, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, by that time, everyone at the table we were sitting at knew what stove up meant, except for this old boy. I had no idea. So what do you do? Do you admit or do you play along? What do you think I did? I played right along. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what stove up is. Okay. So instead of just moving on the conversation, the conversation went, well, what do you think it means? I was in trouble. I was in bad trouble because I had absolutely no idea. Anybody else not know what be stove up meant? Just out of curiosity. Okay, thank you for those of us who know. To be stove up means be stiff. That's kind of what it, right? It's, it, you fall, you take a shot, you take a hit, and, and you can't quite move. It's to be stove up. It's, I don't get it. It still doesn't make sense to me. But when you do this number right here, and you go, oh, that's getting stove up, okay? I should have just said it from the word go, but I didn't. And you know what? Do you think the, the embarrassment was worse or better than if I had just admitted it from the beginning? It was way worse. I mean, like, from the day, like, till the day I left, that's a running joke, okay? Like, to this day, it would be a running joke. You know why? Because I made it worse. Pride exacerbated the problem. It made it worse. And what we think is, oh, if I just hide it, and if I don't tell it, I can can fake it till I make it, that we're going to be okay. But the longer you fake this thing, the harder it's going to be to come clean. And the worse the consequences are. They don't get no better. And it becomes something that is a a mark on your heart and a scar on your life that is so difficult to deal with. And I'm telling you, you you've got to be willing to be open with others and honest when you don't know. Because proper perspective embarrasses pride and it exposes pride, but exposed pride is better than fatal pride. Can I just say that? Exposed pride is way better than fatal pride. Because exposed pride heals. Fatal pride has no recovery. So the disciples were embarrassed because on the way home, they'd been arguing about who was the greatest, and Jesus found out, and they were a bit exposed. This happened, though, each time that Jesus predicted his suffering and death and resurrection. The disciples would begin to ask about their place in heaven. You get the the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. They ask, you know, can we be at your right and left hand? Right after Jesus bears his heart to them, they're consumed with pride about their proper place. I hate this because this is me. I hate this because I am so consumed with, okay, God, thank you for all that you're doing, but where do I fit in this thing? And I get so consumed with my life and that I'm going to be okay, rather than just boasting in the pride of Christ, his victory and his victory on the cross. I like that James Edwards comments on this. He notes well that the disciples are going to flip Jesus' purpose on its head from what he meant it to be for them. In all three passion predictions that we get in the book of Mark, he says, Jesus speaks of the necessity of his rejection, 
his suffering, and his death. Those are the three things that are in common and all the times that Jesus talks about the future. And following all three of these, the disciples voice their ambitions for status and prestige. And Jesus speaks of surrendering his life. The disciples speak of fulfilling theirs. They see Jesus' sacrifice and his purpose and his future plan as a plan for them to succeed. I don't know about you, but that's me. When Jesus lays out his life and he lays out his plan, I think, okay, God, how do I fit in this so that I can succeed? How can I fit in this so that I can prosper, so that I can provide, so that I can do all this, that, and the other, instead of being absolutely consumed with God's glory and living and walking in that? Because, folks, that's what they're, they, should, they should just be glad that they're there with Jesus. The step and the path is not what's 100 feet in front of you. It's what's right there in the moment. Some of the best advice I ever got was a little bit hard to hear. A pastor friend of mine named Rob, I was sitting with him and some other wise pastors, giving some wise counsel to some young guys that were just trying to fill their way in the world and ministry. And, and Rob kind of looked at me dead in the eye when we took a break from the discussions we were having. He said, let's want to talk to you for a minute. He said, hey, man, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm all excited. I'm thinking he's going to tell me, you know, you're, you've got some great potential. and You're going to be a great leader. And da, da, da. I'm all excited. I'm ready to receive that. Anybody ever felt that? You just knew that you were about to get what was due. And what he said instead was, Les, you need to learn how to be where your feet are. I thought, what? Man, I think, I think you got the, the wrong. The compliment was supposed to come the other way around. He said, Les, you need to be where your feet are. You don't need to worry about what's going to happen down the line, your family, what church you're going to be at one day, this, that, and the other. He said, you just need to be where your feet are. You know, he was right. Because the fastest way to fall into pride and losing your footing where you are is to look at what's way ahead. To look off in the distance and to ignore what's right in front of you. I love my kids. Y'all know I love my kids, but I've got uh, one or two that will just slap run right into a door. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking, they'll be running down the hallway, looking this way, going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, boom, right there. Just about getting knocked clean out. And not just a door, a door handle. Yeah, okay, I get it. Just Goon, right, that, that head going back. There's not a whole lot worse than that. It's either that or it's running across a parking lot and tripping and falling and skinning up knees, right? So they're just not looking where you're what? Going. Not looking where you're going. Looking off in the distance maybe or looking to the right or looking to the left. That's pride. That's thinking I got it all figured out. And these disciples, they're not looking where they're going. They're looking off in the distance. They think they've got it all figured out. And folks, we absolutely do the same thing. We look off in the distance. We look at where we're going. We're looking at this. We're looking at that. We're looking at the other. We're looking at this job or this vacation or this break we're going to have. And instead, we miss what's going on in front of us all the time. Pride blinds us from truth. But if we will humble ourselves, be where our feet are, and serve faithfully, humility will, will reveal the path that God has set out before us us he counts the cost of discipleship jesus counts the cost of discipleship the disciples instead of costing counting the cost of discipleship instead of hearing him say i must die they start to count their assets what they've got what they're going to gain the disciples have yet to learn that the rewards of discipleship come only as a consequence of following christ and the direction to follow Christ in is not a direction that leads to glory first. That's looking off in the distance. Do you know what the path of Christ meant for them? And what the path of Christ means for us? Death of self. For them, it was a physical death that was going to have to happen. Their glory they received did not come in the form of a seat at an earthly throne to the right or to the left. Their glory and our glory is only found in heaven and eternity with Jesus. And now that future glory means present glory as well for him. But not to pride and have boast, boast in ourselves, but only to boast in him. So Jesus then addresses their pride by saying that they must change their understanding of him. Get this, folks. You ready? This is, this is important right here. This is just revolutionary change. You ready? We must change, not God. We must change, not God. He never changes. He is immutable. That means he is impassable. That means he does not ever change. So if something's wrong 
or somebody needs to grow, or that relationship gets better, or life needs to change direction, who do you think has to change? Hello? Me. We've got to change. We've got to be the ones who are willing to say, I look at my life, and I know I have to change. Because if you cannot do that, you will be spiritually wandering, if not dead. So here's how he tells them to do that. Isn't it great when, God, when Jesus tells you how to do things? I, I find that to be really helpful because I don't necessarily always pick up all the clues and all the things left on the ground. So he sits the disciples down and he says, okay, listen, dummies. That's, anybody feel like dummy sometime? Listen, dummy, is that directed to you? That's directed to me. Listen, dummy, here's the thing. Verse 35, this is what he tells them. And he sat them down and he sat the disciples down. He called them together and he said to them, if anyone would be first... He must be last of all, and what's the other part there? Servant of all. He must be last of all and servant of all. Does that mean, like, last in line at the playground? Because that's what I used to think. Anybody ever think that? Oh, that means you must be the last person in line. (laughs) Here, you ready? You know what the most vaunted place is, the most hallowed position is in the Southern Baptist Church? You ready? Just to exercise the most humility the most I'm willing to sacrifice in the world. You know where it is? In the back of the line at the dinner on the grounds. Right? Isn't that what it says? You got to be last of all. Hey, no, no, no. You go before me. No, 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 no. You go before me. Look, I don't mind telling you. Look, I want to let other people go first. Sure, absolutely. But that fight to be last can be, that can be the worst. I mean, there's, I've seen people lose teeth over that thing. Right? That is a bad place to be in. This is not literally saying the person who's last in line at the dinner on the grounds is going to be the first in heaven. So let me free you from that guilt. You're welcome. That's what you get to take home today. Robert, you free from that, brother? You feeling that? You're free. Yeah, you good, Thomas? That, Thomas, that doesn't mean you go first. That just means you're, you don't have to go last. Okay. That's not what that means. To be last of all and servant of all does not mean you just self abase that's the term, right? That's to, to, oh, I'm just going to be humble and I'll, I'll, that's that stomach growling, oh, that's from the Lord. No. There's no extra blessing in that. Y'all can laugh. That's funny. That's okay, right? Uh, there's no extra blessing in that. You know what the blessing's in? The blessing's in being able to love people and make much of them. The blessing's in being able to serve people with a servant's heart, not to let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. And if we're doing that, by the way, whoever the last line in person, I'm not getting on you, okay? I, I like to be the last in line too. So I'm not, I'm just saying that's not the most important thing in the world. What's important is understanding why. Why? Because Jesus doesn't just tell them that you have to be last of all and servant of all. See, here's what, again, James Edwards on this says, service to others is the primary way in which believers imitate and fulfill the mission of Jesus. Y'all, faith saves us. Amen? Faith alone saves us. Amen? But let me tell you this. Faith is never alone. It's a great Matt Chandler quote on that. Faith is never alone. Faith is accompanied by good works that serve God and others. If you want to grow your relationship with Jesus, find other ways to serve the Lord. And I'm not talking about just being busy. I mean genuinely serving His purpose. Not another ministry, another function, but practically serving someone who's in need. So he says, they must be last of all, they must be servants of all. Folks, humble servants and humble service serves God. You want to know why we're supposed to do that? We're not supposed to do it so that other people can see just how humble we are. Jesus does a great thing here. He uses an illustration. Isn't that a good Southern Baptist preacher thing to do, to use an illustration? Right? We're supposed to be good at that. You can nod if you agree. Right? We're supposed to be good at that, coming up with illustrations. Jesus was the master illustrator. He's standing there, teaching, or he's sitting there, sitting with his disciples, teaching them, and uh, one of the kids that's in the room, we don't know whose kid it was. Peter may have had some children, may have been some of his family, but they're there in the room, and he just grabs a random child. Isn't that good? That'd be like me just going, uh, you know, hey, so-and-so, come on up here and bring the child up front. Not that I've ever done that. I think I actually, I've done that and offered a Snickers before, right? Thomas, I've done that to you, hadn't I? I have. I've I've done that. I've offered Snickers. I've offered candy, all kinds of things. Jesus doesn't offer 
a, a tasty treat, so I'm one up there. Maybe that's the no, that's pride. See, pride, humility. But he brings this child up there, and he makes this statement about the child. Look at 36 and 37. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to him, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Here's the illustration. Jesus takes this child, wraps his arm around him, and then makes this statement. Does that sound odd to us? No, right? Like, what are you supposed to do with kids? You love them. You put your arms around You wrap them up and tell them how much you love them. We've said, is it important to know that their culture is different from ours? Let me tell you, it is very important to know this. You may not know this, but maybe I'll educate you a little bit today, okay? Children in this culture, especially girls, but boys too, until they reach the age of 12, were considered unimportant. Isn't that sad? Completely, I mean, not just unimportant. They were on the same grounds as the servants, except they were less useful. When they raised children, they raised them alongside the servants' children because mom and dad barely had any interaction with them until they were 12 years old. They almost disowned them because it was mentally for them healthier to separate a child from the family in case it died than to welcome it into the home. So this child that's there is not like somebody's beaming pride standing in front of them. This child was just a random object in the room just a random object in the room not something that's cute and precious like we see them but something they would have seen as listen listen to this dirty worthless and easily dispensable and Jesus takes this worthless dirty dispensable thing and he wraps his arm around it. Whoa. He's telling them, you want to know what's important? You want to know how to actually judge whether or not you're serving your last of all? Here's how. Be willing to do what I'm about to do. He's not telling them, be like the child who's worthless and dispensable. That's what he's, not what he's saying. He's saying, if you want to serve and you want to be blessed by God, and you want to find what true humility looks like, this is what it looks like. You ready? You take the broken, you take the hurting, you take the dirty, you take the one that nobody else wants, and you wrap them up, and you love them. That is what it means to be last of all and servant of all. To not be too good to serve anyone. And I will tell you that if we as a body of Christ are too proud to serve the least of these, we should be ashamed. We should be ashamed. We're we're consumed with returning this church to the glory that God has established in it before. We're consumed with saying, man, we want to stop losing people to death or going somewhere else. You want to know what we need to do? We need to love people. It's okay to say amen there. We need to wrap our arms around like that child. And to not worry about whether or not the person that comes in has a pocketbook to be able to write a check for a tithe. But instead to say, that person comes in as a soul that God values and loves. And I'll I'll say this because I don't even know, I don't remember the name of the church, so I can't brag on them. So I, I can't do that. And I won't say the name of the other church that's right around there. But there is a prominent Baptist church in the city of Dothan that has been having people flee the doors for a two decades now, has split, has had sin in the camp, cannot recover. And, I mean, not even a quarter of a mile down the road, a little bit of church that Robert, you and I both got to interact with this week. I don't, I don't remember the name. Don't, I mean, I don't, you may not even remember. I just know that their pastor is a guy named John. Random enough name that you're not even going to get to know him, okay? John was pa- is pastoring a church that was there that had a couple hundred people. It split because they had some sin in the camp that God had to deal with and sent them away. And that church got down to about 75 people. But those 75 people were there, decided they were going to love the little child from this story. They started learning the names of the people that lived under the bridges around the backside of the courthouse. 
they started welcoming people riding by that were homeless on bikes with bags full of their clothes, giving them something to eat and trying to set them up with a job. They just learned their names. That's, Robert, I spent Wired, I spent one week with your group. Robert was with them. And that was the thing that stuck. They knew their names. And when they saw them, they didn't turn and hope they didn't come and approach them. Instead, they offered them a free snow cone. By the way, with our Southeast Alabama Baptist dollars, which is awesome. We get to be part of that. But they were loving this child. And the reason why I'm doing that is so important is what Jesus says next. He says, because when you love this one, you serve me. And you love me. And when you serve and love me, you don't really serve and love me. You serve and love the Father who sent me. The illustration of the child is the disciples are not to be like the children. They're to be like the Jesus who embraces them. Whoever receives someone in the name of the low, in the same as the low class child, the one with no value, the one who can't give back, whoever receives that one loves Jesus, and by love, loving Jesus, loves the Lord. That is humility. Humility is not making less of yourself. It's making much of others and making much of Christ, which makes much of God. So here's going to be our invitation today, our chance to respond. It's going to be in this. Number one is pride shielding your eyes from truth. I want you to ask that. I want you to pray that. I want you to look over that. Is pride shielding your eyes from the truth? Is it keeping you from hearing God's word, from seeing the path in front of you? Are you maybe looking out in the distance rather than being where your feet are? Maybe you're wondering, okay, brother Les, I established that I've got this issue in my heart but that I need to work through, but how do I do that practically? Well, God's Word says here that we humbly serve God, and when we humbly serve God, we've got to do that by humbly serving the least of these and people. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? Lay on my heart a ministry, a person, something to go and do, and I'm, God, I'm telling you, I'll commit to do it. So if you would, just bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. I want you to deal with those two things. Number one, God, am I walking in pride and not seeing what's right in front of me? Maybe you're embarrassed. Maybe you fall in that category we talked about earlier about being too embarrassed to come and admit that your relationship with Jesus is either damaged or non-existent. I, what I want to invite you to do is to come and to get on your knees in front, I mean, in front of God and everybody. Hopefully nobody's looking. They're not, certainly they're not going to be judging you, but what you need to do is come and deal with that with Him. God, I, I'm more afraid of what people will think of me, therefore I refuse to ask, and you are going to be a victim of your pride yet again. If you fall in that camp, I encourage you to repentance today, to, to address that issue, that apology and repentance to God, and then to find the way forward. Maybe you need to pick up here at the finding the way forward portion when you say, I know I've got a relationship with Jesus, but I've just kind of been spinning my wheels. I'm stuck in a rut and I don't know where to go. And you need to ask God, God, reveal to me who that child is in my life so that I can embrace them and love them. I want to give you a chance to do that. Just a moment of silence in just a minute. Ask God. Respond to Him. Be obedient. Come as He calls you to come. Pray. Intercede. Maybe intercede for somebody. But until we get that right, nothing else is going to fall in place. we give you time to respond now. You come as God calls you to come. We'll sing in a couple minutes. We'll pray. But right now, I just want you to move as God calls you to move.
working on you. This is still a time to move. It's not, we're not closing this. We're not going to be done until God's done. You just need to pray right where you are. You do that, and when the Spirit lifts and allows, we'll move forward. Father, may we be humbled by you, by the example that you give us in Christ, by the way that we fail and falter on our own, and God, by the way that we need you. May we stop faking it in front of others, stop walking in a way that dishonors the calling to which you have called us, the Son who has sacrificed so much his name we pray. Amen. You stand, we sing, and as we sing, you respond as God calls you to respond. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your presence in this service and for those who made decisions for you, Lord. We ask you just to be with us as we leave out of here today. And we take these words and stow them in our hearts and let them live in every day. In your pleasure. In your name we pray.